I'm here at my yurt near the town of Twist, Washington, and I'd like to talk to you about The Social Network. Aside from being the name of a movie that you've probably seen and, and the uh, obvious the, the background behind uh, Facebook, the idea of a social network is a specific thing, and I want to try to get to that specific thing. Well, let's start by the idea that um, every human being is connected, and what you see here on the screen is a diagram actually of, uh, of my family tree going all the way back to um, our earliest roots in Africa. And what you can see on this diagram is a set of routes that human beings took out of Africa. And what it basically shows, and I think what's been established pretty much beyond reasonable doubt at this point, is that um, we're all connected. Go back far enough, and whether you think it's Adam and Eve or whether you think it's some kind of um, uh, you know, hominid in Africa, we've all come from common roots. There is a, there's an obvious and, uh, and ultimate connection between all human beings. But when we talk about a social network, we're not talking about a genetic connection. We're talking about a social connection. So let's take a look at this concept of um, a social network. And we'll look at it in two parts. The first way to look at it is as a network. And so as a network, any network is a, is a collection of connected nodes. The word node is a very specific word we use to describe one unit, one particular part of the network. So a network is a set of interconnected nodes. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the vocabulary around networks in a moment. But I want you to start from this idea that it's a network. It's a set of people. Each person is a node in the network, and all of those nodes are interconnected. How are they interconnected? They're interconnected because you know those other people. So it's, that's the sense in which it's a social network. It's a social network because it's a set of interconnected nodes, those nodes being people, all of whom know each other. All right, now let's get a little bit more specific. We're going to use this concept of a social graph, and I think the social graph was actually the, the term, or at least the, the term social graph, was coined by, um, uh, by people at Facebook to denote the way that, all, that you are connected to all the other people that you know. So we talked about the idea of a social network being a network. That's a set of nodes that are interconnected. Each of those nodes is a person. They're connected because you know the other people in the, in, um, you know the other people to whom you're connected. So on the diagram here, you can see um, a zoomed out version and a zoomed in version of this thing called the social graph. And actually, I got this off of Facebook. If you want to go to Facebook and, um, and search for social graph, you can download the Facebook app. That'll give you your social graph. Social graph is no more than a picture of you and all the people that you know on Facebook and who's interconnected to who. Not only who are you connected to, but who are they all connected to. So if you're not connected to somebody on Facebook, it won't show up on the social graph. But if two people you know, two people you're friends with on Facebook are connected, they'll both show up on the social graph, and your connection to them will show up as well as their connection to each other. So that's the zoomed out picture is here, and um, the zoomed in picture is in the corner there. And you'll see that what it does is it takes the profile pictures of all these people, puts them in little circles, and when you click on a person, it shows by darkening the lines who all their connections are. You can zoom in and zoom out on this graph, and you can look around, and it's kind of fun to play with. So I'd suggest that you do that. Go to your, go to your Facebook account or go to someone's Facebook account and, um, and find the Social Graph app and, and, and check it out. Check out what you look like in the Social Graph. Okay, so the Social Graph is how we are connected, at least as far as Facebook's concerned, how we're connected. And of course, it's limited to the people who are friends with you in Facebook. It's not all your social connections. It's only the social connections that you have with people who, are, who you're friends with in Facebook. Let me go over some terminology. I've already given you the, the idea of a node. A node is one piece of the network. And whether we're talking about an uh, interconnection of web pages, or an interconnection of people, or an interconnection of computers, or anything that's interconnected, a node is an individual element. And in the case of Facebook, a node is a person. Nodes, links. Links are the attachments, the associations from one node to another. In the case of Facebook, it's the, it's the attachment from one person on Facebook to one other person who's friends. And we'll get a little bit deeper into that idea of a link or an association in just a moment. But I want to give you the Facebook terminology. And I don't know why Facebook didn't just say nodes and links. You'd think that they would say nodes and links. But instead, they say objects and edges. So one thing to add here is that the nodes in a Facebook in, for Facebook don't only have to be people. They could be other things as well. They could be locations. They could be events. They could be all the different things that when we talk about the information model of Facebook, you'll see are the Facebook objects. So they're not, in the case of the social graph, they're people. But in the case of, of Facebook, they call each of these nodes, each of these people an object. But the word object can apply to more than just a person. 
So instead of saying links, which is pretty clear, they say edges. So we have two people and there's an edge between those two people. In a way, it kind of makes sense because you can see person one, person one over here kind of touching person two over there and there's some edge between them. But it's a little bit of an obscure kind of terminology. At any rate, nodes and links are the, are the standard terminology for any kind of network where you have things connected to each other. And Facebook tends to use the words objects and edges. And we'll hear more about objects and edges later when we talk about the information of Facebook. Three other concepts that I want you to have and I want you to be able to understand. The idea of a hub, the idea of a spoke, and the idea of an isolate. A hub, as you can guess from the word itself, is something in the middle. Now we can see in the picture in the corner of this slide here, um, a person. It happens to be Doel. Doel is the uh, student services coordinator for the informatics program at the iSchool at University of Washington, and he's a hub. How is he a hub? He's at the center of many other connections, and you can kind of see that if you look at this image. There's Doel in the middle, and there's all these lines radiating out from Doel. He's in the middle of a lot of interactions. That means he has a lot of friends, and a lot of those friends know each other through him. That's the idea of a hub. So if I say you're a hub person, what I'm saying is that you're in the middle of a lot of other people who don't necessarily know each other, but they all know you. So you're the hub of interaction. You're the, you're the place where all the, all the information flows through on its way out to other people. Those hub people are really important. Hub people are the, um, are the ones that you likely know. Maybe you're a hub yourself and know a lot of other people. And so they're, at the, they're kind of the social center of groups of people. Okay, so there's hubs and spokes. You can see all the spokes hanging out from, from Dowell there. And the spoke people are the people who are connected to well to Dowell. Now, a spoke person might also be a hub person in some other group, but they're in relation to the hub, they're out on the edge of the hub. Okay, so those people who are, who are spokes to this hub probably have lots of other connections as well. Um, they just happen to be closely connected to this hub person. The hub person is the social, is center of social interaction. The spoke person surrounds that person who's at the center of, center of social interaction. And one other kind of person is the isolate. The isolate is a person who's connected to a whole other group of people by just one other person. They're isolated. They have one connection and only one connection to a group of other people. When we talk about the isolates, we talk about people who are out on the fringe of the group and are only connected to the group by one person. And in fact, if you look at this diagram, the, the, the zoomed out diagram, you can see that there's lots of people hanging around the edges of these different clusters. And each of those people hanging around the edge of the cluster is connected to that cluster, that group of people who know each other are highly interconnected. And they're only connected to that group by one person. Doesn't mean that they're lonely, doesn't mean that they're isolated. It just means that to, with respect to that group, they're connected by one person. Okay, nodes and links. Nodes are the objects in the network. Links are the connections between those objects. Um, we call, uh, Facebook calls them instead of nodes and links, objects and edges. We have the hub people who are at the center of interaction. We have the spoke people who are out connected to the hub people and also interconnected to other people in the group. And then we have the isolates who are connected to the group only by one link, only by one person. All right, so as you can see from this diagram, um, there are clusters. These are all the people I know. This is my social graph. And you can see that they're clustered. There's, this, um, there's these groups that are surrounded by a kind of a pink circle, and they represent groups of people who are very highly interconnected. They're really connected to each other, and they're only loosely connected to other people. But as you can see, in all the cases, I have one, two, three, four distinct groups showing here. Um, the groups are all at least connected to each other one way, and that's through me. They're all my friends, right? So I'm, in, a, in essence, I'm at the center of the social graph, and um, and I'm connected to everyone in this social graph. But in addition, you can see, for example, if you look at this, the smaller pink circle, it's connected by one person in that pink circle who connects it to these, this other pink, pink circle. So there's people in each of these groups that are spanning the different groups. And they're the ones through which information might travel from group to group to group. Okay, there are also very important people because if you cut out that one person, these two groups become unattached. So that's the notion of groups and Facebook Facebook has only recently come to that notion of groups where your friends are clustered. And frankly, I would imagine that the reason Facebook has come to that notion of groups is because of competition from Google+. Google Plus's main competitive advantage, at least what they were originally selling, is that they know the different social configurations you're in and you don't always want to share information with everybody in your social network. Sometimes you only want to share information with people in a certain cluster and you can create those clusters yourself. You can see that people cluster naturally and it ought to be pretty easy for Facebook to figure out 
who's in each cluster, and in fact, they can do that. Um, but it's also possible that you yourself can create those clusters and make small groups as small or as large as you want for the purpose of disseminating your information. So groups are a, new, a newer concept, at least in, this, in, um, in social networking applications. Um, and a group is a set of people who, who are connected to each other and only loosely connected to the people around them. And now this, there's functionality in both uh, Facebook and Google Plus to allow you to, dis, to, um, to define those groups. Okay, let's move along then. I want to point out a major flaw, as far as, I can t as far as I can see, or at least a major omission in the way that social networks are construed in both Facebook and Google+, Plus, um, and that is that the relationships are all of one variety. Those links, those edges, are all of one variety. They're friend. All the people I've friended are all the people that are connected to me on Facebook. So I don't have a way of differentiating what those relationships are. But obviously, friend is not the only way that I'm related to people. I'm related to people who are genetically related to me, father, son, mother, daughter, cousin, aunt, uncle, etc., etc. And so here's a blow up of a piece of the, um, a piece of the Facebook social network that, um, or a piece of my Facebook social graph with some of that filled in. Two things to note about this. First is that not all relationships are the same. Every two people have different kinds of relationships. And of course, once you start thinking about it, there's all sorts of relationship. Friend is like best friend, associate, maybe up and coming friend, old friend, childhood friend, school friend. There's all sorts of kinds of friends, right? So that's kind of why that I think these social applications haven't really touched this idea of named relationships, which is what we're talking about, a named relationship between different people in the, um, in the social graph. It's because it's too complicated. And you'd have to actually type that in and you'd have to think about it. And that's kind of a problem. And we'll see this problem over and over again in information organization is that theoretically, there's all sorts of ways that people are related. But do I really want to think about it and write it all down? That would take me forever. And I don't actually know necessarily what I think about all the different ways I'm connected. It's very, very complicated. At any rate, I want you to know this idea. And the idea is that when two things are related, their relationship itself can have a name. In the Facebook social graph, the only relationship name that we have, the only kind of edge in Facebook terminology or link in network technology in terminology is friend. Everybody's equally friend of everybody else, whether it's your mother or whether it's some distant person that you've hardly ever met. They're all friend. But if you look closely, you'll see that those relationships are named. Now, another thing that I want you to know about these relationships, one is that you can have a symmetrical relationship. That is, one person is related to the other person in exactly the same way the other person is related to the first. And if you look at brother-in-law and cousin here, those are symmetrical relationships. Two people are cousins. A is a cousin of B, B is a cousin of, age. It's, uh, of A. It's a symmetrical relationship. Both people are related to each other in the same way. Now look at the son-father relationship. That's an asymmetrical relationship because A is related to B in one way, B is related to A in a different way. So it depends what kind of relationship it is, depends on who you're looking at it from. Okay, to summarize this idea, one of the major missing things from the way social graphs work in Facebook is the idea that relationships can be named. There can be a type of relationship, a type of link, a type of edge in Facebook terminology. And when we add that in, we see that it's really complicated, which is probably why they're not doing it yet, even though eventually I'm sure they'll try to do something like that. So concept number one, the idea of a named relationship. Concept number two is that those relationships can be symmetrical where A is related to B the same way B is related to A, or they could be asymmetrical so that A's relationship to B has a different name, it's of a different variety than B's relationship to A. Okay, so I hope now that you have the concept of a social network and specifically the concept of this social graph that shows you and all your friends on Facebook um, and where it, um, where it ends, and it ends at this idea of named relationship. So now let's talk about what these social networks do. Well, so why would we care about a social network? What would, what's the point of even thinking about the social network? Well, I suspect that, it, you know, that you don't need me to tell you that, first of all, it's kind of cool. Why is it kind of cool? I think it's kind of cool because we're all social beings. And because we just like it, it's, it's kind of neat to see all of our relationships between all these different people. We, we, we care about it. We innately care about our relationships to all these other people. And in fact, um, it's a major part of who we are. A major part of who we are is who we're related to and how we're related to them. Um, but in, in addition to that, it's got some sort of practical applications. 
first of all, it's really good for connecting to people. I want to see where you are. I want to see who you know. Oh, did you know? I didn't know you knew that guy. I didn't know you guys were friends. That gives me some information. That gives me some insight into you that you're connected to these people that I didn't know you were connected to. We're connected. We have, and don't you do this when you go on Facebook to see, oh, we have 27 mutual friends. We ought to know each other, right? That's the, that's the basis of Facebook suggestions, actually. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So it's inherently interesting. It's useful for connecting. It's also to in interesting in a very technical way to see how information is, um, oh, I've lost my place here. I have a touch screen here, and every time I touch my touch screen, weird things happen. Let me get back to where I was. There we are. Okay. Um, we'll see in a moment that you can chart information flows, and it's very useful for us to know as people who, especially people in the field of information management, to know how information flows, and information flows via social networks. Okay, and then finally, and I'm afraid that for our purposes in this course, especially studying Facebook and the other applications that we'll study, that the major usefulness, the major thing that social networks do is they allow you to be marketed to. They allow, they allow people who want to connect with you to know how to connect with you. They, know, they allow marketers to know what kind of things they might suggest to you. They also, in a, in a less sort of you know, um, commercial or crass way, they allow applications like Facebook to know what to suggest to you. All right, so let's go through some of these in turn. Isn't it just cool? I mean, don't you just want to see your social graph just to kind of play around with it? I know I do. When I, when I downloaded this social graph, it was like I took you know, a half hour where everything just stopped while I perused around and checked it out and looked at all the people and the connections. It's just fun. We're social animals. We want to do this kind of thing. We want to see who our connections are. Okay, so moving forward from that, however, um, things like Foursquare are examples of how your social network allows you to um, connect with people and see who you should be connected with. Foursquare, if you don't already know, is a way of saying, I'm here, where are you, and tracking all your, all your friends in, um, in, in space, basically, and, and knowing, um, you know, knowing who you could meet and who's around you and all that kind of stuff. And in fact, there's lots of other social network software now that allows you to, um, uh, to map your friends and also to, um, uh, and also to find people with like interests. There's um, something that is probably at this point moved out of experimentalness. And that is, for example, if you're at a conference, all the people at a conference have the same general interest, but you pass by somebody in the conference that has specific interests that are like yours. And your specific interests and their specific interests are broadcast. And when you pass that person, it might beep you or it might give you a little message that says, hey, this person is interested in social networking too. You ought to like talk to them. And then, of course, they're getting the same message. They'll turn to you and they'll... Um, uh, they'll turn to you and they'll uh, say, hey, you must be interested in social networking. Let's talk. So this idea of social networking is really a, a way of connecting. And we use it a lot to find out who our friends are or who our friends ought to be. And again, I'm getting this thing to go away from me. Okay. All right. So let's talk about information flow studies. You see three kind of paradigmatic way that, ways that information flows in organization. In the background of each of these pictures is an organizational chart. And an organizational chart, if you haven't seen it before, it says, here's the person at the top of the company. Here's all the people that report to that person. Here's all the people that report to that sub person. Here's all the people that report to the sub sub person. Right? So that's the organizational structure from a hierarchical standpoint, from a sort of an outline or a table of contents of all the people in the organization. We'll talk much more about that later on. What I want you to see right now is that superimposed on that org chart, on that um, standard sort of view of the organization, are some arrows that talk about different ways that information can flow based on social relationships. When it flows from the top down, it's flowing down hierarchically from the people higher up in the organization to the people lower down in the organization. Higher up meaning at a more global scope in the organization, lower down meaning at a more local scope in the organization. So the information flow in this case is top down. On the other hand, we can have information flowing from the bottom up. Top down might mean the president of the company makes an announcement, we're going in this different strategic direction, and that information he gives or she gives to um, her lieutenants, her lieutenants give it to her lieutenants, her lieutenants give it to her lieutenants until it bubbles down through the whole organization. Or you can have bottom up, where someone, for example, someone on the phone says, uh-oh, um, you know, we have, this, we have a problem with our software. It's, it's crashing when you run it in this and that sort of configuration. And they tell their manager, who tells their manager, who tells their manager, and the information flows back up through the organization 
and that's the difference between a top-down flow and a bottom-up flow. There can also be flow via those social hubs. So the, the, the third diagram up in the corner here shows a person who happens to be highly connected. Now, if I looked at this diagram, I'd say they're an isolate, right, from our, from our vocabulary before. They're only connected to the rest of the organization by one strand. Well, that shows you that this, are, that this diagram actually doesn't really tell the story. Classic social hub person inside of an organization is an administrator or a secretary or a receptionist or someone like that who interacts with a whole lot of people. And all you have to do to get the message out in the entire organization is tell that one person. As far as this view, this hierarchical view of the organization is concerned, they're not connected. But if you looked at their social graph inside the organization, you'd see that they're totally connected to all sorts of people. And that when they know something, they spread it out to all of those other people um, uh, very quickly. So these three, kinds of, these three kinds of flows in organizations, oftentimes when we're trying to make something happen in an organization, change to happen in an organization, or analyzing the way an organization uses information so that we can best present it or best distribute it, we'll look at these three different models and, and say which is the right way to go about it. Now, not that these are the only three models, but what I want to show you is that they imply different sorts of social networks. We have this hierarchical social network, and the bottom-up and the top-down are all about the hierarchical social network. And then we have the interpersonal social network that the third diagram talks about. So social networks are also good for allowing us to understand how information flows. Information flows through social networks, and as you can see from these diagrams, there's not only one social network, there are many social networks all imposed upon each other simultaneously. And I think you probably know that from your life. You have a school social network, you have a neighborhood social network, you maybe have a relative social network, and those social networks overlap. Okay, um, let, me, let me take a moment out to distinguish two things. The idea of personalization versus social networking. We've been talking about a social network all along, and we've been talking about how that social network is the way you connect to other people because you know all those other people. Um, and it's not the case that when you get an advertisement, always it's because of your social network. A lot of the advertisements you might get or a lot of the reasons that your site looks the way it does, especially Facebook, is because of your social network. But there's something larger, I think, going on here and something that's actually more useful, more directly useful in targeting information to you. And that's this idea of, a, of personalization. So what I liked, the things that I put into my profile, my status messages, even my comments, they all have information about me. They don't necessarily have information about my social network. They have information about me. And someone like Facebook or any other social app can read that information, can infer something about you from that information, and can target certain ads to you. And you can see in this slide that um, uh, I've had these things targeted to me, the class of 1978. That happens to be the year that I graduated from high school. Gee, how did they figure that out? Well, all they needed was my birthday to figure that out, which I guess I must have typed into Facebook at some point. Um, then I have this thing at the bottom for UW, right? So how do they know that? Well, somewhere in my profile it says I'm from UW. So it's much simpler than using my social network. They're just simply, um, they're just simply reading my profile and targeting ads to me for that, from that. And then there's this one for Canlis. I don't know if you know what Canlis is, but it's some fancy restaurant. And they obviously got that wrong because I'm not a fancy restaurant kind of guy. But they thought I was somehow, and they targeted that ad to me. So there's a difference between targeting something based on what we know about you and targeting something based on social networking. So let's look now at what kinds of things do get targeted to you based on social networking. Obviously, your friend recommendations, right? How do your friend recommendations work? Well, here's a person who's not in your network, but they, um, they know a lot of the same people you know. Shouldn't you be friends with them? Right? A very obvious and clear way of using the social network to customize or make suggestions or do things on your site. Um, another one um, that you see here under um, uh, 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 Eno Likes Babies Are Us is using what people have liked in order to give you an incentive to check that out as well. Well, if Eno Likes um, Babies Are Us, then I'll probably like Babies Are Us too, so I should check that out. Now, I, I get this one from Ina, and on, on this ad and a few others, um, uh, pretty often on my Facebook page, and she's a, she's a student of mine, actually, and I asked her, like, how did that happen? What did, um, you know, did they ask you about that? Did they pay you for that? Um, you know, how's that, how's that working? And she basically told me that at some point they, they asked her, was it okay to have her uh, featured in ads? And she said yes. And now she has no idea which ads she's featured in or how she's being used on Facebook. So Inna is actually being used extensively by Facebook 
in order to target ads to her friends, people who have friended her on Facebook. And it's not necessarily that she wants to be. And she was kind of surprised and a little abashed when I talked to her about it because it wasn't exactly what she wanted to do. But the point here is that her liking something and the fact that she's my friend, you might infer that, well, if she's your friend and she likes something, then it's more likely that showing you in the context of this ad is going to get you to be more responsive to it. That's a way your social network is being used in order to target ads to you. And then there's, um, there's, the, there's a little bit more straightforward ones like Mark used this uh, application and Seth used this other application, so might you want to use this application? Now, I don't want to be, I don't want to pass judgment on these things. And I think it's really more up to you to figure out whether, is that a good thing or a bad thing? So let me give you this kind of idea about, um, about targeted ads. Um, and I don't think it's as straightforward as saying, well, that's really evil that they do that. Because maybe it matters to me. And maybe, you know, I think Seth's really, you know, he's really an awesome guy. And if he uses this thing, I want to use it. So whether or not this is good information to me or whether this is manipulative, I think is really in the eye of the beholder. Of course, Facebook will tell you that it's not manipulative at all. It's really what you want. You want to know what your friends are doing because that's the major reason why you do things. On the other hand, it undoubtedly helps the advertisers and it undoubtedly gives them a little bump to present the pictures of your friends associated with their ads. So I'll leave it, I'll leave it vague and I'll, I'll give you a chance to, to work through that issue for yourself and decide in what cases is this moral, in what cases is this reasonable, and in what cases is it, um, is it pernicious and you don't want to have it happening at all. Not up to me to make that decision. That's really, um, that's really for you.